Thank you very much, folks. Can I get your attention, please? Thank you, folks. You might want to take a seat any time in the next half a second. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I could get... Thank you, Kieran. Ladies and gentlemen... Welcome to the 2006 Eclipse Cricket Lunch here at the Four Seasons. Folks, I want to thank the people from Eclipse for dealing me in, and not just for dealing me in, that's the smallest thing they've done. They've organised a fantastic lunch. We've got a great room full of some excellent people doing the right thing by a number of charities. I'll explain a bit more about that later on, but we've been very well served. Good friends, good company, good food, good wine, loads of wine. And the other thing is we're not going to work for some hours. So you've all passed John Howard's Australian Values Test. Any of you who haven't aren't citizens are now qualified. Some players like Phil Tufnell, uh, who most people remember. Who I remember on his first tour out here, someone had shouted over the fence, hey, Tufnell, lend us your brain. I'm learning to build an idiot. <laughs> so it's, you know, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a real character. And he did. Yeah. So. <laughs> Has Julian Clash just been any influence on your career at all? Um, Positive or negative? Last time John O'Neill was our guest, one of our other guests was John Coates from the AOC and I had the privilege of interviewing John Coates and I asked him what I'll ask you now John, I asked John Coates how specific were the performance benchmarks of the Australian Olympic team in 2004 and he was able to tell me right down to the medal what they expected to achieve. Can you tell me how specific your benchmarks were as the CEO going into the World Cup? Well, st stepping back a moment, I think the, the benchmark was to qualify. Um, when you haven't qualified for an event for 32 years, it does tend to sharpen, sharpen the focus. Folks, there are not many players, if you can put their highlights video on screen, that 400 people in the room just start clapping spontaneously. Please welcome Mark Eller. It's my privilege to talk to these gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here. I hope you're as pleased as I am to be in the company of such tremendous footballers and blokes who've played very, very hard when they're wearing the gold or the black jersey. John, I'll start with you because you are our guest up to a point in this country and it's a little while since... Well, not all Kiwis in Australia are guests. But John is. Can I tell you... John O'Neill, the idea of getting talented people to run sport there must be a lot of people who are excluded because of the politics, because of the, the unusual things you have to do to get towards the top gig. <laughs> can you tell us whether there can be room for improvement in the way that the people are appointed to the various positions whereby people who are talented and want to help aren't going to be scared away by the various impediments in the way? Very good question. Uh, <laughs> I, I think sport uh, as a business, I'm not talking about the community end, but once you move into the uh, to the large business end of sport. And there are two types of comedian in the world, folks, those who make you laugh and those who don't. They're the only two categories. And Paul Martell is in the only category that matters. A very funny man. Please make him welcome. Thank you, Andrew Curry, one of the great commentators and hosts. It's, it's great. Thanks, folks. Now, I will need your attention because there's a fair bit to do today and it's all going to be very good fun. I can promise you that much. But just sit down, please. Thank you. Folks, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Curry. I've once again been appointed Master of Ceremonies for this particular event. That's largely to do with pricing decisions. I, I am very happy to be here, I should say. It's not as easy to get this gig working for nothing as you think because correspondence does come to the committee from time to time about all sorts of stuff. The president feels lots of letters, as do the committee in general. Somebody wrote a letter to the club saying, is Andrew Curry emceeing your lunch? Will he use the same trivia questions as last year? Is he some sort of dickhead? It's actually three separate questions. The answers are yes, yes and no. Folks, we're very happy with what's happened today already. There are over 800 people in the room, which is an amazing achievement. Some of you may be aware of the story of the Australian cricket side at the Oval in 1948 chasing a bit over 400 to win a match against England and Arthur Morris, the left-handed opener, said to Brabham, how will we get these? And he said, well, just get them in singles. There are almost 800 people paying today and that implies about 800 phone calls or emails or messages. Some of them have made two and three times by various people chasing up, 
guests today. It's a massive amount of work. It's not just a one act. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I say, ladies and gentlemen, it's about a ratio of 98 to 2, so good luck. Folks, just when you finish the sentence you're on, in fact, the syllable you're on would be even better. Thank you for joining us today for what should be an absolutely fantastic afternoon at your employer's expense. It is shaping very well. There's some great elements in place, not the least of which is this venue. I mean, this is an extremely great room to be in for an event like this. It's a place where war's been declared, where prime ministers have been nominated, and that the Eclipse boys have chosen a venue like this to set the tone for their lunches. It says a lot about the standards of this event. There are four elements in place. One of them is the venue. The other is nourishment. And that actually includes food as well, in case you weren't aware. But there's a fair bit of food and grog might be flying around this afternoon, including buckets of James Bogues, which James Bogue is probably the third most famous Tasmanian after Martin Bryant and Errol Flynn, and he's done, doing God's work with that product, so please get stuck into it. If you are a vegetarian, I hope you enjoy the salt and pepper on the tables. It'll be fantastic. It's very good pepper, that stuff. That's some of the best I've ever had. And folks, also talent, by which I don't mean myself sadly, but rugby talent, rugby intelligence. A bit later on this afternoon, I'm going to have the privilege of talking to four guys with very, very direct hands-on experience of Bledisloe Cup rugby and, of course, World Cup rugby. I'm talking about Brendan Cannon. Mark Heller, John Kerwin and David Wilson, who will be our special guests this afternoon. So we'll learn a fair bit about their careers, but hopefully learn a bit about rugby, what's going to happen in the next sort of 24 to 48 hours and the next few months as we head into the World Cup. And finally, folks, the fourth element you've been given today is opportunity. The opportunity I'm describing is to assist some pretty worthy sporting and sports-related charities, but also the opportunity to find yourself something pretty good to take home whether it be in the silent auction, the live auction, or in the raffle. And I'll just remind you, in case you're not aware, many of you, I feel quite certain, did not pay for your own ticket here today. You're what we call in Australia piss takers, freeloaders, long lunches. And I applaud it. Don't get me wrong. I think it's the way to fly. I've actually been paid to be here myself, so I'm one step above you blokes. But not enough, mind you, but the point is I'm here. But I would encourage you when later on somebody asks you to put your hand up for an auction item, or to buy some and get the silent auction stuff, which is very, very good. Just have a good look at it and bear in mind that there's a charity, more than one charity being helped, and that you might be able to make a difference. We also have a return cameo from John O'Neill. John O'Neill was our keynote speaker here two years ago, and that was in the, sh the shadows or the aftermath of the Rugby World Cup. Well, this time it's in the aftermath of the Football World Cup, and I'm very Keen. I'm looking forward to talking to John about sport and about soccer and broadcasting and the whole business in general. But I commend John for what he's done with Lodi Takiri because I think that was a very important signal for sport. Okay. Brett, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Brett, was in, in your time in the Wallabies either as high performance bloke or as a player in the squad? Was it self regulation? Was it curfews? What was the balance? I think it's, uh, it's a really interesting question, and, and uh, actually, the, the CEO of our organisation. Mike Hawker. Certainly uh, regarded, I think, world round now as a great sporting administrator. Could I please welcome to the podium Mr John O'Neill. <laughs> Folks, it's a hallmark of these lunches and the work that Ray and his committee do that our guests are so well known that they almost need no introduction. I mentioned before that our next guest, John O'Neill, was the main man when the Rugby World Cup was in town. He quickly skipped over to the next biggest thing, or the bigger thing, in fact, which is the Football World Cup, the FIFA World Cup. His involvement in both of those things has clearly been considered by the public a great success. The good news and the bad news in the best interest of the game. I was a player of this club without distinction for 12 seasons. And the only person I ever voted for on any board was for myself to be club captain in a controversial campaign. <laughs> and I could speak to all my mates who I played with, and we've never voted for an official at any level outside of our own club, and even rarely then. So what is the equivalent of a voter or a shareholder or whoever it is, a constituent that actually has, to which the board is actually responsible by some sort of ballot or connection? Well, I, I guess it's best to describe Australian Rugby Union as a very large mutual.